Hi, I'm Andy McClellan, President and Training Director for Environmental Education Associates, an accredited environmental certification training provider here in New York. I'm with you today to discuss the rights and wrongs for coronavirus decontamination. You've of course seen, heard, and experienced the practices and procedures for stopping the spread of the virus. These efforts are expected to cut down transmission rates of the disease, and it's been super impressive to see most folks adopt the social distancing, hand washing, and personal protection that it's apparently going to take to cut down on the number of deaths. The estimates for global fatalities without these efforts is about 40 million people dying. But if these practices are universally adopted, that number drops to about 1.5 million. Seems like a really good idea. We've all heard that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and this is certainly the case here. If we can eliminate the virus before people make contact, we can significantly decrease the likelihood of new transmission in many places where folks have no choice but to interact. The successful approach that OSHA and other organizations dedicated to public health and worker safety have adopted has been to deal with environmental hazards before folks can be exposed by using what are called engineering controls in safe work practices. Engineering controls include procedures and equipment to reduce or eliminate the presence of a hazard. You've seen or heard about special disinfectants and techniques like fogging that kill the virus on contact. This is a very effective technique provided the right procedures like using the correct dilution of the chemical and controlling the coverage area are used. The chemicals are designed to kill viruses and require special procedures to protect those who do the applications. Those who do this work need to be wearing advanced PPE to protect them from both the chemical properties that kill the virus and to protect against the virus, of course. The safety data sheets, which are included with commercial chemicals, provide the details on chemical hazards and required PPE. The chemical manufacturer's mixing and use instructions, along with the safety data sheets, are critical to making this work. Just a quick word on using bleach or chlorine. Most of the time, folks just splash a little bleach around, get a whiff of the chlorine gas, and expect the best. Problem is, most people dilute the stuff, which makes it less effective, of course, and put themselves in harm's way by not following the instructions or wearing the correct PPE. It's also got a very short kill time, which means it won't be very effective on a durable virus like COVID-19. Chlorine bleach will evaporate within a short period of time and has no wetting ability on porous surfaces. Porous surfaces are where the majority of the stronger strains of contamination are found. Wetting abilities, the capability to penetrate into upholstery or other building materials such as carpet, wood, fiberglass, insulation, fireproof, or ceiling tile. Bleach is as commonly used as not the best option for controlling coronavirus. It's also important that we control the area where the use of disinfectants will be used. The chemical manufacturers establish standards for coverage. It's super important that users contain the area where the disinfecting will occur so that they can be sure that the application works and that no contamination is released during this process. Personal decontamination units should be used to make sure that those who enter or exit the work area are cleaned up and don't become a vector for carrying contamination. Those who do this work need protection, of course. Those who work in the environmental or industry, uh, remediation industry are familiar with wearing PPE and have the knowledge to wear it properly. Anyone who performs decontamination needs to use the respirators and protective clothing the way that they've been trained. That means using tight fitting respirators, at least the half face, but preferably the full face air purifying P100 mask with consideration for chemical cartridges required by safety data sheets. Protective clothing should be similarly appropriate to make sure that the workers' bodies aren't exposed to the chemicals and that they don't carry the contamination out. Anytime an employer issues or requires use of PPE or when an individual decides to wear PPE, they need to follow procedures for the proper use of the equipment, including medical evaluations for respiratory fitness. OSHA requires that all employers establish hazard communication, PPE, and respiratory protection programs, regardless of the type of respirator you provided, including the N95 and N100 fitted face pieces that you've heard all about. We want to make sure that those who do this work don't get harmed. We've heard a lot about that concern for health workers and others that may be in harm's way. 
You can take steps to reduce their exposure by treating the spaces or the buildings that they're in or working in. We need to make sure that the procedures that we use to decontaminate buildings are done properly in a way that ensures success and doesn't create other problems. The environmental remediation industry exists for just this need. Let's use the resources that already exist to deal with this crisis, and let's make sure that what we do works. For more information, including coronavirus decontamination worker training, visit our website, environmentaleducation.com, or give us a call at 888-4-ENV-EDU. Be safe and be careful.